Howdy. My name is Mark. I'm a staff site reliability engineer at Indeed. Thank you all for taking the time to come to my talk. Uh, I'm super excited to share all that we've learned over the last eight plus years of running Vault. If you're not familiar with Indeed, we're the world's number one job site. Everything we do is to help job seekers find their next big opportunity. More specifically, the team that I lead owns Console and Vault, as well as the platforms and tooling that we've built up around those two tools. So Indeed helps people get jobs, but we make sure that their information is secure while they're doing that. We're going to talk about three main topics. First, how have we built up a resilient vault? And then we're going to talk about how we keep an eye on it, as well as how we handle on-call, alerting, and then general observability. And finally, we're going to tie it up with a neat bow talking about operational excellence and how we iterate and improve through operational reviews. Before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about how Indeed works under the hood. Indeed is made up of thousands and thousands of microservices and scheduled jobs spread globally across six cloud regions. We use Vault performance replication to ensure that the services in each of those regions has lightning fast access to the data that it needs. Our main golden path for applications involves using Vault Agent within Kubernetes to deliver secrets to applications before uh, they start up. This is important to this talk because if Vault goes down, that means we can't start new workloads. Right? So if we are trying to roll out a bug fix or fix production and Vault's still down, we can't. There are also many, many other tools that read from and write to Vault. Users might be leveraging Terraform to spin up cloud infrastructure, writing those secrets to Vault so that they can be used from GitLab CI jobs or their daemon in Kubernetes. Or maybe a workload in AWS Lambda is generating credentials to talk to console to do service discovery for some sister service in another platform. The list goes on and on and on. So when Vault breaks, that all comes to a halt. And people get really, really mad. <laughs> so how do we make sure that Vault doesn't go down? How do we keep our users happy? Our first line of defense is making sure that no one can unintentionally DDoS our clusters. We have some legacy patterns at Indeed, as I'm sure everybody else does, uh, that have forced us to support applications requesting so many more secrets than they actually need at startup. And what this means is that large shifts in our Kubernetes clusters or a daemon restarting that has hundreds and hundreds of instances can easily cause a thundering herd on Vault. We've built two lines of defense for this. First, our load balancers have set request rate limits. We do performance testing in lower environments to understand exactly how much traffic a Vault cluster can handle before it tips over, and we make sure that it can never actually get there. Beyond that, we have a lot more fine-grained control in Vault to limit specific namespaces or clients that we might know are troublesome or we just don't like. Uh, and that way, we have really fine-grained control over who is using Vault and at what pace. If you're planning on stress testing your clusters, you should check out Vault Benchmark. It's a really cool tool that in May, HashiCorp released that, allow, that makes codifying your regular traffic and benchmarking clusters really easy. Just like you define your infrastructure as code, you define your traffic patterns and stress tests as code. The tool already, the tool already supports a really comprehensive set of auth backends and secret engines so that you can easily map your standard client interactions and reproduce them in lower environments. This is an invaluable tool to understand how your current configuration, and more importantly, how any future configuration changes, could impact cluster performance. Since this talk is about reliability 
and it's called All the Nines, I felt it was really tactful to include this slide. Please do not, do not stress test your production clusters. That's not the point, don't do it. Um, you can very easily tip over, actually the whole point is to tip over your vault clusters, so don't, don't do it to production. Scale a QA cluster up, have fun with it, then do it in production. Talking about our infrastructure, it's all immutable. Each server is an ephemeral EC2 instance that's booted from a custom AMI that just has vault, Datadog, Filebeat, etc. Just the basics. These AMIs are fully tested using a suite of terror test functions that actually spin up, bootstrap, and verify a cluster before we promote that AMI for use in a higher region. On first boot, Ansible uses EC2 metadata as well as some secrets from Secrets Manager to uh, template out the host configuration. This means that we can build a single generic golden AMI and then ship it as is to all of our disparate cloud regions, relying on Ansible and the surrounding environment to provide the last mile configuration. As an example, we've got a snippet of, some, uh, of a Jinja template, and then after running Ansible, we can see that that, that configuration was templated out. At this point, Ansible then can start uh, Vault as well as its dependencies uh, through system D. At this point, because of the Raft auto join and go discover configuration that we just rendered, Vault reaches back out to the EC2 API. It reads the metadata for all the other uh, servers in this cloud region, finds the right peers to join, and forms a cluster. And then we're done. No one touches these servers. <laughs> Humans do have access, but if something's not on fire, and I catch you SSM'd into one of these EC2 instances, it's gonna be a bad day. Normal configuration changes go through the same process that normal code would, right? So they, they're checked in to Git, they're reviewed. Uh, this, make is, this not only makes the infrastructure reviewable, but it also makes it observable, right? Because you can check the version control. So if Vault's broken, you can check who broke it, which is pretty cool. So once that node has found its peers and it's replicated its data, we use uh, AWS Key Management Service to auto-unseal these nodes. If you aren't familiar, Vault stores an encrypted copy of its root key on disk. It's this key that it, uses, that it encrypts child keys that actually protect your data. So instead of relying on Shamir's secret, sh secret sharing algorithm and human key holders to decrypt this key, we delegate encryption and decryption to AWS KMS. Vault uses the instance profile of the EC2 instance that it's running on uh, to reach out to KMS and unseal itself. Both AWS IAM policies directly on that role, as well as uh, policies on the key itself in KMS, make sure that only Vault servers can do this, keeping the key secure. By default, AWS considers a node that it can ping healthy. Without additional checks, we'd start sending traffic as soon as an EC2 instance can ping. That's kind of a big problem, right? Because we just talked about how Ansible needed to run. We just talked about how it needed to replicate data and unseal all before it can handle its first request. So Vault provides uh, a really basic uh, API call that you can make that uh, models the basic health status of the service. But Vault's really complex. I don't know if you've ever run it. It's, it's got a lot of bells, it's got a lot of whistles. Uh, and so it's hard to model the status of that in a single HTTP status code. And there's also operations that we need to do both to verify the state as well as automate as we scale up and down. 
So for these instances, we have EC2 lifecycle events that actually reach out and trigger lambdas. These lambdas have the ability to log into Vault using AWS IAM roles and either observe or even mutate the state of the cluster. This makes sure that we can easily treat, we can easily treat servers as cattle, not pets. Uh, by automating away manual verification and cluster maintenance. Want to replace a vault server? Axe it. We don't care. The infrastructure around it will clean up after you. Right? So you terminate an instance indiscriminately. You pick one, you kill it. I do it all the time. It's really fun. Uh, that goes into the terminating state, which triggers a lambda, which logs into vault, cleanly removes that cluster peer, from the RAF cluster, exits zero, and then tells EC2 to continue with the termination. Right? So a thing that you would mainly have to go into a node and you know, find its name and click a bunch of buttons, automatic. So take a second and think about all of the steps you do when you're spinning up and down a Vault server. If Vault doesn't have an integrated facility for automating that, that's where things like lifecycle events become really handy. And finally, we deploy Vault in auto-scaling groups across three availability zones and leverage Vault, Raft, Autopilot redundancy zones. This gives Autopilot context into exactly where it's running and allows Vault to make some really important resiliency decisions all on its own. In our base configuration with three zones, and six servers, it gives us three voting peers and three non-voting peers that serve as performance standbys. This ensures we have read scalability with the performance standbys and redundancy with a boatload of servers. All of this together gives us a lot of room for many, many different failure scenarios. Let's say we lose a single node. This could be a hypervisor failure, this could be something on the host blowing up, anything. Autopilot immediately recognizes that we lost a cluster member and promotes the other, service, the other server in that redundancy zone to be a voter. Meanwhile, our load balancer notices that it's failing its health checks and removes that node from the target pool, draining traffic so that we don't send clients to that server. The autoscaler group also sees that failing health check and terminates the node, which triggers the lambda, which removes it from the, cl the cluster. And once that's completed, the autoscaler replaces that node with a brand new, fresh node. That instance bootstraps itself, joins the cluster, unseals itself. You getting why all that was important before? As soon as it becomes healthy, the load balancer starts sending traffic to it. What happens if we lose an entire redundancy zone, though. Autopilot picks another redundancy zone and promotes a non-voting peer to avoid breaking quorum. Depending on the nature of the loss, right, there's a lot of things that could make a redundancy zone go down. Normally, it's somebody with a shovel hitting a fiber line. Sometimes it's rain coming through the roof. Who knows? But depending on AWS's own ability to reach that data center, we might also scale up the other two regions uh, to avoid uh, being underscaled and, and failing that way. The really important part about this is that no human lifted a finger. I didn't press a single button. For our, oh, don't do that. Uh, for all I know, uh, this could be happening in my infrastructure right now. I don't care. Uh, Vault and the infrastructure around it self-healed. But I should probably know if that's happening in my environment right now, though, right? And that's probably important. So how do we keep an eye on Vault? How do we uh, make sure that our users are happy? Because I'm an SRE, at a high level, when we start talking about monitoring and observability, I'm going to talk about service level objectives. They literally, they pay me to talk about SLOs. And so fundamentally, if you're not familiar, 
An SLO is a, a way of tracking if our users are happy with the service. And so it tends to make sense to start with a high-level user story. Uh, a really simple example is, as a Vault user, I need to request credentials from my database. Once we have that metric, we then measure it over time, and we keep track of what percentage of time our users were happy. This is where you start to see things like 99.9% .9 uptime. Uh, it's incredibly important to note, though, that despite the name of this talk, the goal isn't always all the nines. The goal is proper expectation setting and observability. We always need to make sure that our users are happy, but setting an overly tight SLO can be really expensive. And it can prevent engineers from doing their real jobs, which is reliability, but it's fine, whatever. They think it's something else. We have three overarching SLOs defined around our Vault clusters. Vault must be available 99.9% .9 of the time. This means it needs to be unsealed, have an elected leader and quorum, and be successfully serving client requests. This SLO is set because Indeed has a target SLO on our client-facing apps of 99.5%. And because they rely on us, we have to have a tighter SLO. Vault must respond to read and write requests within 500 milliseconds. The agility for, of us to stop and start our workloads is incredibly important at a platform level. Right? We've built a bunch of assumptions, and other teams have SLOs around startup time. And so it's really important for Vault to be fast. And if it's not fast and it gets too slow, we can delay important deployments. We can prolong production outages, et cetera. We track these on our dashboards with seven and 30-day rolling windows so that we always have a snapshot into what our error budget is remaining and uh, our past performance. But we're not perfect. So what happens when we start to burn our error budget? Instead of talking about how we've built our monitoring and observability, I thought it'd be much more fun to do this in the context of an actual incident, because our favorite thing is to be under pressure, right? So without further ado, we've got our first page. Cue the sirens. Indeed employs the concept of dev first responders, where the teams who build the systems are the ones on call for those services. Within our organization, we spread DFR responsibilities across multiple teams. So the person responding to this page very likely isn't a Vault expert. They might be somebody who works on our service mesh, somebody who owns our Kubernetes clusters. We'll call them Vault adjacent. They know what Vault is. They know what it does. And they probably use it every day. Right? It's a, a thing that they come in, they get their coffee, they update a secret. But they certainly don't know how to fix it off the top of their head. So let's dive into the details and the processes that we've put in place to make this possible, and more importantly, sustainable. All of our monitors are split into consistent informative sections. First, the title tells us where the SLO is set, right? so 500 milliseconds. Then we give information about where we're burning error budget and what the current value is. Right? So you can see which data center and it's taken a lot longer than, than 500 milliseconds. The impact and action sections are there to help the responder gauge the importance of the page and give them a springboard to jump off of in solving the problem. And then finally, we require links to the services runbook and any relevant dashboards. But what's a runbook? The goal of the runbook is to think critically about the monitors you're creating and what could actually make them alert. From there, we have to think about important metrics to help responders confirm those issues and remediate. Common phrasal patterns start looking like, if metric A is doing something, do X, scale to Y, etc. Each monitor, when it's created, must, 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 must have an entry in the runbook. Because if it alerts and it doesn't go to me, which it very likely won't, Somebody has to know how to fix it. 
So let's take an example. So let's look at an example from our runbook. You can see it details how this specific alert is measured and then notes common issues that could impact the metric. It gives details about specific relevant parts of Vault and explains how external factors could impact the issue. It even references specific metrics to check to help you make better decisions. And I think we've got most of what we need from this, right? It gives us, you know, if you, if you start to see a bunch of traffic, you know, check out ton, toning, tuning quotas and rate limits. So let's actually go to a dashboard, right? There was one linked. Oh, God. It looks like somebody just slapped all of Vault's 700 plus metrics on a single page. That's not great. And throughout my career, I've landed on so many of these dashboards. Uh, a team will make their system emit metrics. They will slap them on a dashboard, link their dashboard in the alert, and then check out, right? The check still clears. This is not observability and it's not observable. As a responder, I have no idea what I'm looking at. And even if I do manage to find a pattern, what does it mean? What's causing it? And how do I fix it? Data without context is almost useless. If you're going to have a metric graphed, it needs to be clear what it is and why it's important. We've set guidelines for our dashboards that require metrics to be grouped into subsystems with easy to consume blurbs about that specific system. Each individual metric that's graphed must also include an adjacent note that explains why the metric is important. Now, if a responder finds an anomaly, they, they have the context about not only the individual metric, but the subsystem that the metric is a part of. They haven't left our dashboard, but they have everything they need to make an informed decision or where else to look. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this slide, right? It's, it's very text dense, but it serves as a, as a good marker to come back and, and look at the recording. Over the years, we've spent an enormous amount of time discovering and distilling the most important metrics for us to understand overall system health. We've broken them down into four sections. This includes uh, system metrics. So Vault can only perform within the bounds of the system that it's running on. So things like CPU, memory, disk, and network I.O., et cetera, uh, those are all very important. Second, whatever storage backend you're using, it's really important to understand how it's working. For Raft, this includes things like transaction count, operation timing, um, lots of stuff about Merkle trees that you probably never need to actually understand. Uh, you also need to have a solid understanding of how your clients are interacting with Vault. And so barrier metrics solve as, serve as a really great facet for this because they, it's the outermost layer of Vault, and so you have the best picture of client traffic. And finally, if you're using enterprise performance replication, understanding the write-ahead log and its replication in state are really important to understanding how your secondaries are performing. So putting our incident responder hat back on, let's go back to our actual dashboards. We can see a huge influx of requests that is most certainly causing the issues that we're seeing. System load is also skyrocketing because of IO weight and CPU utilization. And you can even see a, a Vault server consume so much memory that it kills Vault and the Datadog agent on the host. Um, if you're not familiar uh, with Datadog, if you ever see a straight, flat line, you're in a bad spot. Our runbook told us that we could tighten our rate limiting to weather storms like this. If we think about that last slide, uh, that gave us a rough metric of how much traffic we were serving before we hit this issue. So now our first responder has almost everything they need to solve the problem. The final key to this puzzle is access. At this point in our incident, 
the responder has identified the issue, found the right instructions in the runbook, they just need to tune the rate limit. All responders are in an LDAP group that's, vault, that's mapped to an external group in Vault with the right access to follow any instructions in our runbook. We also include some common troubleshooting endpoints as well in case responders need to follow or end up on relevant public HashiCorp documentation. But you might be thinking, this feels like a lot of access to give to somebody who isn't a Vault expert. Keep in mind that users know they're only supposed to use these endpoints within the context of the runbook. We give them very clear, if you see X, do Y. Otherwise, they know it's time to escalate. But that still feels like a Band-Aid, right? We didn't actually make anything better. Yes, we weathered a storm. We are back within our SLO, but we didn't, that doesn't feel like operational excellence. That feels like a Band-Aid. So how do we actually approach operational excellence? Is we review and we iterate in operational reviews. This is where we review the pages that we've sent and make, sure, and make sure that they were actionable, that they were actioned on, and ensure we aren't abusing our responders. It's also impractical to alert on every small blip or anomaly, so operational review serves as an opportunity to actually look at that fancy dashboard you just built. Right? Go back two weeks. Does something look weird? Cut a ticket. This meeting is also a great time to celebrate recent wins, failures, or demo promising new technologies or concepts. Did we automate a toilsome process? Was there a production incident that involved Vault that we need to follow up on? Did we learn about a new feature in Datadog that might help us better monitor our systems? The most important outcome of these meetings, though, is the forced cataloging of operational tasks. This ensures we are vigilant and constantly iterating on our platform's reliability, resiliency, and documentation. We can catch, small, we can catch potential issues before they happen and document patterns we're seeing in tagged tickets. As we plan sprints, we can filter for these tickets and make sure that we're always dedicating time to progressing operational excellence. And that's it. We built resilient, self-healing vault clusters. We made sure we can understand how they're performing. We enabled a team of vault-adjacent engineers to respond to common failures. And we created a feedback loop to make sure that we were always improving and iterating on our patterns. Thank you for taking the time to come to this talk. I hope you got a lot out of it. If you want to dive into any of these concepts, uh, I'm, I'll be out in the hallway and in the hub the rest of the day. Um, but thank you. Thank you.